Hello and welcome to Story Radio, the podcast for readers, writers and lovers of short stories. This month on Story Radio, we are talking to Kate and Greg Moss. Kate Moss is the author of 10 novels and short story collections, including the number one best-selling The Joubert Family Chronicles, The Burning Chambers and The City of Tears, as well as the multi-million selling longer doc trilogy Labyrinth, Sepulchre and Citadel and Gothic fiction, including The Winter Ghosts and The Taxidermist's Daughter, which she has adapted for the stage for 2022. Greg Moss, her partner, has written for stage and taught and encouraged developing writers at West Dean College and many other places. His first novel is a futuristic thriller called The Coming Darkness. It has been described as Blade Runner meets John Le Carre. Kate and Greg, lovely to meet you both and welcome to Story Radio. Thank you for having us. Lovely Great to, to be, be here. here. Thank <laughs> you very much. Do you both have a background in stage writing? And I just wondered what you thought that had, the way in which that's affected your approach to narrative. I think it helps to write punchy sections of drama so that you're not having to think about the whole of your novel all the time. It's really tempting to think that on every page of your novel you're writing the whole story, but you're not, of course. You're just writing that fragment of drama that you're focusing on at that, that one morning at 6.30 when you get up. That's the fragment that your focus should be. And of course, theatre is like that. Theatre evolves in a sequence of discrete scenes. And a lot of the drama comes from the audience comparing what happens in different scenes and making up their mind about what that means. In a way, it helps you to understand that writing for theatre helps you to understand that the text is the evidence and the audience is the jury. <laughs> mm. <laughs> That's really lovely. But is it, I, I guess some, I think from people I've read who've worked in both mediums, it can, can work in two ways. I think with you, it's kind of like... Um, you've kind of kept that constraint, whereas a lot of other people suddenly having this ability to kind of, you know, describe everything and every interior thought and so on, they, they go completely the other way. Just a brief response to that. The first draft of The Coming Darkness is 170,000 words. The published novel is 98,000 words. Hmm. So clearly I did exactly what you just said. <laughs> and was, was, it, was it other people's response that made you trim it back? It goes like this. First draft, mine. And then I rewrite it. Second draft, so I'm probably down to about 145,000 words then. I showed to Kate, and she had some brilliant editorial ideas. The next draft goes to my agent, and now I'm down to about 125. We do some more work on I say we, I, do some more work on it. And we're down to about 112 when I give it to my editor, brilliant editor at Moonflower, Christy Doherty. Hmm. And with her excellent concise scalpel like notes it ends up at 98,000 so it's it's a repetitive process of refining did you find it difficult no. you didn't go of those things no, no not at all some of them will be in the coming storm which is the sequel that I'm currently writing hmm. and other things were just exactly as you described it over elaboration and also I think it was the thing that happens when you're writing a novel is that at certain moments, if you're like Greg and I, where we've worked with words and, you know, for all of our careers, we've internalised an enormous amount of editing and how you structure and do all of those things. So there is a sense when you write that you are discovering the story. You mm. know, I'm not a planner in that kind of way. I know the sort of novel I'm going to write, how it's going to play out, and I know the sort of characters I'm going to have. And I usually have a beginning point and an end point. I don't really have anything else more than that when I start. So I tend to write quite a lot more than I need and then pare it back. And it was so fascinating watching you do that because I have too much internal dialogue with people and you had almost none because you're used to writing words for actors because they bring that, whereas I'm used to having to put everything on the page. And so when I was writing for theatre, I was putting too much of the internal stuff in my descriptions and my stage directions because I have never had actors doing that for me before. So we, we had the opposite experience. Didn't That's we? a really good additional thought. Yeah. The, what we call in the theatre the subtext, mm. the thing that is not said 
but which everybody knows was almost said. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's some... Um, you can quite often just spot people who have a written first stage just from the way that, uh, that subtext works, whereas it does tend to be a bit more vocalised. Also, somebody you know, said to... dialogue oils the page. Some really... I don't think it was Agatha Christie, but it was somebody very celebrated. And it's true, isn't it? When you open a book and it is... 100 pages of dense prose without dialogue. It's just action and description. It's a bit dispiriting, isn't it? Because there, <laughs> there isn't that change of rhythm that you get from allowing diff- the different voices of the different characters into the yeah, text. Yeah, I mean, it's... But the thing that I found that was quite strange, having done the adaptation of Taxidermist Daughter for the stage, which was on this April, yeah, it opened yeah. this season here, which is Festival Theatre, which was an amazing experience for me. It's extraordinary. It was just a new experience as well. But what was very interesting, I, you know, writing a, a novel at the time, was that I had stripped back so much that normally description is a very large part of what my readers love. Mm. And there were some scenes where there was no description at all. I'd forgotten to say where they were. Because I've got so used to just the words in somebody's mouth. And that was quite interesting. I could see that, you know, I then had to, oh, yeah, I need to put some stuff back in here now. And I've just actually written a scene, darling, when you were in London, a chapter today, pretty much all dialogue. So I'm now going back and saying, oh, mm. it'd be good to have a bit of a description of what the what those uh, of you looks like. <laughs> another thing that you do brilliantly is your characters are always purposeful. And purposeful characters explore the world of the novel. So it's not like the description is the Wikipedia entry for the new location. Mm. It's a necessary part of the character journey into this new place. And that's a technique that we don't use in theatrical writing. Because, of course, theatrical writing is mostly, not always, but mostly a sequence of static scenes that drill down into character and motivation and they're not exploring a landscape. But you, you kind of chose a genre which doesn't really lend itself to a lot of kind of interior monologue and description. What that... thrillers? Yeah. Hey, but look at that John le Carre dis- uh, comparison, which I'm super grateful for. That is an important aspect of John le Carre's writing. And of course, it plays out in The Coming Darkness because my hero, Alexandre Lamarck, Alex is conflicted because perhaps this is where that very generous comparison comes, he's conflicted because he isn't certain that he can trust the orders he's being given. Hmm. And if the orders that he's being given aren't trustworthy, it means that he's not the good guy after all. Yeah. Now, of course, it's a thriller. So in the end, he must be, right? You have to read it and find out. (laughs) I still have many questions. I need to read it again, I think. (laughs) How does your approach to world building compare? Have you learned things from each other's approach? I think the thing is that we have always been very closely working in, together in that, you know, I worked in publishing and Greg worked as a reader for me. Greg had been an interpreter in Paris. You know, I didn't help with that in the slightest. But we've always talked about our ideas, but we're very, very different writers. And so the thing is that the way that I research, you know, history is my thing and that I love, and the way that I write and build a world is completely different from the way that Greg does it. And in terms of the way that you write, it's completely different from the way that I write it. And that's, of course, why we can be good editors for one another. So it's, I would say that we don't learn things from each other in terms of what we would take into our own work. What we do is bring our different sensibilities to editing and reading each other's work because we would never have written it like that. And that's why I think it, is, it works so well. A really, a really clear difference, Tabitha, is that Kate is a brilliant researcher and assembles everything that she needs before she writes the novel. Whereas I look for things as I go, as I find that I need them. And that's very different. So different. So different. Mm. Sort of hunt and peck versus... <laughs> I don't know, perhaps building a nest, I'm not quite sure well, no, going with that Building metaphor. a nest and collecting for the winter, because writing a novel is like a long, yeah, enduring yeah. winter. I think that is it, and actually, you know, it's, for me, because, because although at the moment, because that's the label, I'm always described as a historical 
fiction writer. I don't think of myself like that. I think of myself as an adventure writer. And so pace and jeopardy and momentum and forward movement are fundamental. And that's very different from a historical novel where actually it's about gently building the landscape. So I need to know, for me, to write in the way that I do. Firstly, I do all my research. I don't hire that out to wonderful PhD students or things like that. I need to do it myself because quite often in the research I find things that I know I can use. But secondly, I need to have all of that at the front of my mind so that when I start to write, so if I'm like, you know, both Greg and I might be in our different ways writing a chase scene. But for me, I need to know precisely what everybody's wearing, precisely what the landscape looks like, because it makes a difference to how you write the scene. You know, if you're writing historical fiction, if you don't know what people wear on their feet, then can they run? Can they climb a tree and they get out of the window? You know, these things are really fundamental to how you write the scene. You can't just add that afterwards. Whereas obviously if you're writing something more contemporary or even in the future, you kind of almost, it's not, I mean, the wonderful phrase that you've used, you know, that it's like now, but more so. Whereas when I'm writing about 16th century, it really isn't. So I, ha I feel I have to be able to see that world before I start. Mm. Yeah, I think there's certain key details that you just managed to pick out, which really just, it's just so that difference that kind of just shows you somewhere else. Yes, and, it's, and you don't need a lot. That's the thing about research, historical research, is that you need to put enough on the page so that the reader knows you know everything. So you don't need to describe every single thing a character's wearing in order for people to feel that they're in you know, the 16th century. But you do need, to, you know, the bit I'm, the, the book I'm writing at the moment is set in the early 17th century. And this sounds a tiny thing, but of course it's very significant that ruffs suddenly were not being worn. Flat collars were being worn. I was writing a scene where somebody's having their throat cut, and that's very significant because it's much easier to cut someone's throat if they've got a flat collar mm. than if they've got a ruff that completely covers their neck. And these things sound so tiny. So it's not describing the ruff for the sake of saying, I know they don't have a ruff, or they do. It's, you know those things, and you put them in, because actually they're part of the plot. Hmm. And they're discovered because the characters come across them. Yeah. In their person, in their purposeful, through the plot. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, when, you know, I, when I'm writing a scene and I describe somebody wearing a belt, if there is any significance to the belt, I won't necessarily mention that because all it says is that I've looked at enough pictures and know that every single judge would wear a belt. But if that belt might be used for nefarious purposes, then it's obviously quite significant because when it disappears, we need to know who's got it, you know. So it's those things that that's how you use the research. That's how you build the world, not by giving a blanket. There was this on the left and there was that on the right. It's the details that you just drop in. Convince me you've done taxidermy. I have done taxidermy. Right. It was the most disgusting piece of research I've ever done in my entire life. And I was really bad at it because I'm very bad at all craft anyway. Um, but it was essential but for two mm. reasons. There is a really visceral thing about doing it and the smell, but also the weight of a dead bird. You know, it's so strange, but of course birds you think of as being so light. And if you've ever had a robin or something on your hand, mm. they are, you could barely feel them. But when you're holding a dead crow, you know, that, you understand where that phrase dead weight comes from. Mm. It's just a completely different thing. And I wouldn't have been able to write with respect for the craft if I hadn't given it a go myself. I have not murdered anybody, however. There is a line at which the research <laughs> does not go, and neither have you. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, I, this head. <laughs> but I did have the challenge of researching the future. Yes, I was just going to ask about that. Go ahead. I'm just interested in knowing how you create a futuristic world, what principles you use to research and build a world. So um, the start, to start with, it's only arm's length. 15 years is not even a generation, is it? So as Kate just said, it's today but more so. The things that we are concerned about have been intensified by the passage of 15 years' time. Then the next thing is that if you read the newspapers, if you read magazines like The Economist or New Internationalist and so on, you quickly find that a substantial proportion of the journalism is not about the past or the present, but it is about the future. It's mm -hmm. about where this current 
preoccupation will lead us in two years or five years or more. And I remember when I used to work in economic research when I was an interpreter, we would talk about two years short term, five years medium term, and then 10, 15 years. That's long term already. But actually, when you look, even at the fast pace of human evolution or, or the evolution of human society and technology now, there are things that change enormously in 15 years, but not everything. Small things. So, for example, in the coming darkness, my characters might well pop out a communication from their comm watch and talk to a holographic representation of the person they're speaking to, rather than have to look at the tiny screen on their mm. eye watch. You know, that, yeah. that sort of evolution seems to me realistic. More electronic vehicles, of course, you know, all of that sort of thing. And you read a lot of science. I do. You read serious things about um, where the world might be going, which, yes. of course, is why it's so vivid on the page in The Coming Darkness, because it feels like um, it's plausible. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. And another thing would be the travel corridors. There, there being a way of organising travel in order to minimise the impact of transgenic diseases. A cruise ship docked today, in November 2022, in Sydney, with 800 COVID-positive passengers on board, out of 4,000. Wow. Mm. So that's as bad a thing as happened right back in March 2020, when we were first in lockdown. Which, by the way, is the reason I wrote the novel, because mm. the, okay. my theatrical career was arrested yes. by the mm. lockdown. I, we couldn't gather together in rooms and and enjoy that wonderful communion of live theatre. Anyway, so back to the question of researching the future. It can be done because all responsible organisations are always speculating a probable future. It's funny, though, because I remember years ago reading Habermas and having lectures on it and, like, this idea that with the internet, you know, truth would not be a problem because everyone would just be able to look things up and, you know, it would all become clear. Mm. I think actually what's happened is completely opposite. opposite. It's, yeah. yeah, there's always that kind of surprise thing that just catches you out. I mean, that's been the interesting thing, writing Warrior Queens and Quiet Revolutionaries, is, of course, we still have this rather lovely but quite naive idea that people in the past told the truth, even though we are living through a time where we are seeing quite wholesale lying by many political parties in all parts of the world and of many political persuasions. So we know that these people now are not telling the truth. We see them lying on television. And then they're caught out and then they have to say, OK, maybe I did know about this and maybe I did that. But when we go back into the archives in the past, we assume that everything we're reading is a true record. But of course, people in the past lied too. You know, one of well, the, they didn't know. Or they didn't know. But I mean, it was their best guess. It was their best guess. But history is always written with an agenda. Always. Mm. It, it's never objective in that kind of way. It, it, it can't be. So, you know, one of the interesting ones in the book for me was Theodora of Byzantium. And what we know of her comes from a historian called Procopius. But he wrote three biographies of Theodora. One, she's a complete harlot and, a, you know, has slept her way to the top and she's dis a disgrace. The next one, she's the most wonderful woman that's ever lived and is being a beautiful wife to the emperor and this is all terrific. And then the third one is about half and half. Now, if we only had one of those, that would be the view of Theodora of Byzantium because it's the only record there is. Hmm. But all of them are seen through the eyes of a man who didn't feel women should be speaking in public. So that's the thing that's quite interesting, I think, about you know, when, you know, writing this book was, in a way, we know we have to make assessments now and read round subjects to get as wide a range. But we accord to the past a sort of honesty that wasn't there. Don't you think writing about a near future, something slightly speculative, like The Coming Darkness, writing things set in the past, writing this brilliant non-fiction, Warrior Queens, they're all in the domain of critical thinking in a way, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, totally. Totally, and also... You know, it's that it's the same thing, isn't it, about what you choose to shine a light on. Mm. I mean, one of the things that's very interesting for me with Warrior Queens has been the, you know, the, essentially there are three different types of history, reason, reasons within history why women are left out. One is just almost all history has traditionally been written by male commentators and they just don't 
think what women were doing matters or deliberate erasure so they you know they someone else taking the credit someone stealing else the, credit, the credit essentially yeah. the middle one is okay there were one or two women but they were just there they weren't doing anything and that particularly happens within science so you know women's work being routine they were washing the test tubes yeah, exactly or holding the coat or making the tea <laughs> and then the third one is okay there were some women there and some of them were doing something but they were the exception that proved the rule and that's quite interesting as well, so that whenever you know you hear one woman, they're allowed to be exceptional, but all the other women around her are raised out. And that's you know the best example of that is probably the Freedom Riders in America, um, challenging the Jim Crow racist laws in the Southern states. And everybody knows Rosa Parks, but she was one of many people. And the narrative has become this one person did it, not everybody mm. else. And so that's been very interesting. You know, starting to you know not only discover all the women that have been airbrushed around the women all the women who've been airbrushed all together but also the way that certain women are allowed to only be one aspect of themselves florence nightingale is a very good example of this she's allowed to be the lady with a lamp but she's not absolutely not allowed to be the brilliant statistician she was she actually invented the pie, pie chart extraordinary love but also she had some really appalling views um, on race and empire and wrote very freely about these things and one of the things that's really important is you have to put all of everybody back in history otherwise you don't get a true picture of history you can't just put the mm. people you approve of back you, well, know? you have the parallel in your historical novels you have the parallel thing that you do put on stage for example in a very important character in the city of tears and the burning chambers is admiral coligny so the leader of the French armed forces, a Huguenot, a Protestant, on sort of the wrong side of history because the Catholic faction is going to take over. Yeah. And he's a real person, and you have to be very sparing how you put yeah. him on stage so as not to falsify the sparse historical record of who he That's was. That's right. Or make it easy, which is, these are the goodies and these are the bads. Mm. Um, and that's always been very important to me, obviously with Warrior Queens, but in all of my fiction. So particularly in Citadel, which is partly set in a women's resistance unit in the Second World War. And there is enormous evidence, of a great deal of sexual assault that was in the right team. And the only way you can kind of deal with that is in fiction, is, you know, one of these appalling men who is, you know, <laughs> appalling, but he is on the right side, he's in the resistance and all the rest of it is, and I gave him a gun and he didn't realise he picked up the wrong gun and when he fired it, it broke his nose. That's all you can do, <laughs> you know. But it's the same thing about not, it doesn't help anybody to simplify it and we see the consequences of simplification at the moment. We do. That it's non, you know, the, this is black, this is white, and we can see where that's led us. Again, that's a, a writerly issue, but also a research issue, isn't it? Mm. Because you want to create a dense web of character, volition, and outside events. And the denser it becomes, the cleverer you have to be to achieve clarity in the climax of the story. Anyway, we've mm -hmm. drifted off from your original question. You should crack on. Yeah, I did have a question just about, related to that actually, when you've got a lot of background information to convey, could you talk a tiny bit to our listeners about how you avoid exposition when you're trying to convey some of this wealth of research and thought and looking at future trends and so on in, in your work. So we touched on that. Yes. Which is that the characters explore the imaginary world on behalf of the reader because they're busy trying to achieve their own objectives. And in doing that, they shine a light on what you need the reader to see. Yes, and I do it usually by having an outsider. Because if you grow up and live in a place, let's say Carcassonne, you don't get up in the morning and go, oh, look at that castle. Look at the turrets on the so castle. So many turrets. Because mm. you've lived there all of your life. There's nothing to remark upon. There's no possible way of you as a character observing these things as if for the first time. But if you have a stranger who's coming for the first time, that's quite legitimate for the strangers to, to say, looked up and saw, you know. So it's quite often that, having somebody who has a different point of view, so who is seeing something for the first time, like the reader is. 
And, you know, for me, that's very significant because people are, you know, uh, I know, you know, people read my novels and then they go to the places, you know, that landscape is fundamental to writing for both my fiction and now my nonfiction. And so that is one way. The other way is... Can um, I add a, re- a, yeah. a thing that goes with that, though? When in the burning chambers, Minou flees the awful pogrom in Toulouse, that's a city that she knows well. But she picks a route through the city so that they can pass incognito. And then there's the great drama on the bridge, whether they will be allowed to cross the river. And these are streets that she knows well. But because of the drama, the pressure that she's under, that they must not be stopped, they must not be caught, she can, she can, uh, her internal monologue and her dialogue with the other characters can be about, no, we'll go this way, no, that way, down there. So even when they know it well, the place, it can still be revealed because of the dramatic circumstances that they're in, make it vivid. Yes, and... Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, in landscape, that's it's quite easy to do that because you're camera, essentially. You're the eyes on the shoulder of the character. In terms of actual information, it's that can be challenging because you've done all this research and you want to put it on the page. You want to tell everybody about, you know, Henry IV has done this and, you know, in my, my case. And then every time you then have to say, but what is the purpose for telling the reader this? If it's just background you need a bit of context because without that then the or the reader doesn't know what's at stake also the texture of the world the, the richness of the, of the world yeah but you have to you know that's what i wrestle with i put a lot in and then i pair it away because i think in the end this is great there's a whole scene that i'm suspecting i'm going to have to lose because i've done great research and it's a fantastic scene but when I look at it in the context of the novel, I'm thinking, I'm not sure that it's earned its place. That's the thing. You mm. always ask yourself with research, has this earned its place on the page? Or has it just made you feel more confident about creating that world? Yeah. My impression is that in your writing, the landscape is just integral to it. And is, Whereas I wondered with your novel whether the kind of narrative idea was there and then you were like finding locations to place it or whether that, whether it was the same. It was always bound to be Paris, substantially yeah. because of my background as an interpreter, gave me those institutions mm. in that great city to start from. How about Libya? So the, that came... So I've never actually visited that corner of Libya that I imagine in my novel has mm. seceded from that failed country after a sequence of civil wars. Because, of course, it's the part of the country, Tobuk, Benghazi and so on, that has access to most of the oil and is therefore a viable country. And I think there, I'm sort of in the tradition of Joseph Conrad. If you've ever read his novel Nostromo, (laughs) which is set in a made-up, seceded nation in Latin America, which happens to have silver mines. And that makes it a viable potential new country. So there's a there's a combination of things, isn't there? There's and I've been to North Africa many times, not to that precise corner, but there's a combination of things that I know from a writerly point of view I can make work, and which make political and economic sense for that key date, fifteen years in the future in twenty thirty seven. But yeah. Was it always going to be Libya or was it something you you had the kind of narrative and then you were looking for locations after? It became the natural location. Imagine Mm. for a moment that I'd set it in, imagine for a moment that I'd set it in sub-Saharan Africa. Every decision I made, narrative decision, all the journeys would be lengthened enormously, wouldn't they? Mm. And it becomes much more difficult to manage the time frame and there's all this Mm. dead time That's another writerly thing. I'd already decided by that point that this, that in the future, Egypt would have closed its borders in a self-protective strategy to become an isolationist regime and not to be exploited by the pernicious balance of payments, balance of trade that is against them between a developing nation and the more developed world. And also because of 
fear of continuing infection of transgenic diseases. So it couldn't be Egypt, which again is mm. a country that I have visited. <laughs> um, f- the final thing, of course, was I was reading about um, I was reading about the history of Libya when it first became. Uh, so that's the recent history, the civil war mm. when it became, and I noticed that there was a connection to the ancient world and the way in which the Greeks and the Romans referred to this corner of Africa, that shoulder of Tunisia, which is very close to the Egyptian border. And I had already decided that because my hero, Alex, because his mother is a historian, I decided that Alex has had a classical education that includes study of the ancients. And so he would know that. Hmm. And that is how the different strands came together to weave this little picture, which then becomes central to the story. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Did you feel it was always going to be a thriller, or did you did you have a yin to maybe try another type of genre? It was always going to be a thriller. That's the long and the short of it. I sat down to write a story of that kind. I wanted it to be a sophisticated and very complete world. So I didn't want to write something like a novella or a long... I always knew it was going to be a novel as well. And when I first started, I, my, my f- sort of frame of reference was a little bit further into the future. And as I began to write it, I brought it closer for all the reasons that we've already discussed. Mm. But yes, it was always going to be a thriller. Yeah. Why was it 15 years? Because I was, I was thinking actually it could have you're been gonna, less, it could have been five years. You're or... going to like this though. If it, when I first started, it was, I called it, my working, work in progress title was 2048. And that was a kind of homage mm. to George Orwell, who wrote 1984 in 1948. And I realised that I didn't want to go as far as a generation. The only real parameter that was fundamentally important was I needed the secession of Cyrenia, this corner of Libya, to have had time to take effect and for that new nation to get associate membership of the European Union. Everything else um, it is a little more flexible in terms of timeline. And, of course, the isolationism of the Egyptian Republic. Everything else is more... Um, to, that, was, that was the reason that it, I couldn't bring it closer. Hmm. And say, well, we've rejoined the EU. <laughs> no, in my novel, the United Kingdom has not rejoined the European Union. Mm-hmm. And that actually, mm-hmm. in one tiny... You actually say that? One tiny... No, I don't, but the, you know it, because there's one tiny fragment about 75% of the way through the novel. It's the microchip, isn't it? You are a very good reader. <laughs> it is the discussion of the perpetrator of a crime who is an English national who has been in the English prison system, but the French can't read his microchip. That's right. Mm. I just sort of imagine mm. that noise. That's, no, yeah. you know. that's very, very good, Tabitha. Very good. <laughs> You've talked about how Alex's main power was paying close attention to events around him. What other key character strengths and flaws does he have or develop through the narrative? It's interesting that, isn't it? Lots of people want to talk them. I've been asked many times if he can sort of see the future. And I gave the answer that you just gave, which is the answer he gives. No, he just pays attention. And you know what sort of writing I'm inspired by there, don't you? It's classic detective story writing, which is one of your loves. Detectives who are brilliant at working out the puzzle because they just have a, I suppose it's a a special genius for absorbing everything and then sifting it down to the essential. But that's the same for your female heroes. They see they are surrounded by these huge, momentous, dramatic events, but they always find a path through them, don't they? Yes, and I think that sense of being noticing that you you make a decision with that kind of thing. Like who or what is your lead character? What is it they can do? And Alex is, 
you know, he does have this extraordinary noticing thing and he's very clever and he's very informed, but he's also wise enough to doubt. Whereas I don't really have the same kind of thing, obviously, with my characters because they are mostly reacting. Because oddly... Yes, like you said, an adventure story rather than the sort of the dark-edged thriller. Yes, and with, you know, in the modern day, your, you know, Alex is, he is an operative. You know, his job is to notice these things. Mm. Whereas my characters very much are ordinary people, for want of a better phrase, who are caught up in history. So they're, it's not that they've been employed to do something or that this is the world that they know or even fit for. It's just, you know, history. You know, I had great fun, although it's rather depressing, you know, writing a sentence about the inhabitants of La Rochelle, who are wealthy, and it's a very wealthy town, and they are essentially almost becoming an, a, an independent state. And they believe, because they are so wealthy, that history won't touch them. <laughs> and of course, we see that time and again in history, that people think, oh yeah, but it's only happening to those people. They're very poor, they don't have any influence, but it will be all right for us. And then, of course, that's not how it goes. But just to answer the second part of your question as well about Alex, which is an interesting one too, I think that the the increasing doubt that he feels of whether he is on the right side, that also plays out in the fact that when he comes to think that possibly the people around, somebody around him is a traitor, his problem becomes that he... this sort of feeds on that doubt. He can't confront each person in turn saying, hey, are you the traitor? Mm -hmm. Because that gives away his suspicions. And so he has to continue to work partly in the shadows and not give himself away. So doubt is my brief answer. I was kind of interested by your kind of setting of ecological activists as the kind of villains really in in the novel, which kind of seemed like a slightly surprising... I'd say I would describe it differently. Right. In a hyper-connected world, where we share medical information, for example, our response to transgenic viruses can be very quick and very effective, as it just has been over the last couple of years. In a hyper-connected world in which it's always sunny somewhere, right? The wind is always blowing somewhere. The tides are running. The rivers are running. It's possible for a hyper-connected globe to have a completely self-sufficient renewable energy network, which means that we no longer burn coal or oil. But it takes a hyper-connected world. At the same time, that same world provides a platform for corporations and governments to supervise, perhaps malignantly, their populations to follow us, to interfere in our lives, to prevent our freedoms. Now, those two things are in balance, aren't they? And the terrorists that figure so importantly in the coming darkness, they want to end the hyper-connected world. They don't see the positive outweighing the negative. They want to go Hmm. back to tabula rasa, as you say in the book. That is what they Hmm. say. Yeah. They basically want to wipe out 50 years of technological advance. And we mustn't talk about how they think they're going to do that. Because that's the last (laughs) quarter of the book. Yeah, Yeah, it's a bit like kind of the Charles Manson sort of, you know, just throw everything up and, you know, see what comes out. I'm going no further. Yeah. Yeah, it felt at times to me like there was a big battle between sort of belief systems and false belief systems within the... Yeah, I think possibly I'm influenced by Kate Moss in that. Because if you think... (laughs) <laughs> about the Longadoc trilogy and the crusade against the Cathars. Hmm. And then Citadel, as Kate mentioned, with the Nazi occupation. And then the Joubert family chronicles, with that opposition between Catholic and Protestant. These huge forces, what, one of the brilliant things that, that you do is you find those hinge moments in history. I mean, I hope to have found one in my imagination in the future. But That's what you do, isn't it? You find a hinge moment in history when things are changing. Yes, and... It is a battle of beliefs. It's a battle of beliefs. Mm. And if if the St Bartholomew's Day Massacre had not happened, and if Henry IV had not been assassinated in 1610, then there would not have been a French Revolution. Probably. 
can't say for sure, but probably there wouldn't have been. So for me, it's always, I like that phrase, the hinge moment. It's about the moment that a different story could have been told. And the belief systems, you know, as we see today, people believe they were completely right and that the other guys were completely wrong. But of course, it's never about belief. It's always about power. And with it, religious war is never about religion. Uh, or at least it's ne never about faith. But then within that, within those huge combats for power, you're what you call just now ordinary people. They will never have power, will they? They will always, to a certain extent, be victims of these tides of history. Yes, they will. But also they will make a decision about whether they are going to fight or give in. Yeah. And that's the thing that, you know, you have to remember when you're writing historically, is that the people then didn't know. You know, mm. there's a great deal written, particularly about the resistance. But the resistance in France, pretty much until 1943, was seen as terrorists by most French people. They were not seen as the good guys trying to rid their country. They were seen as the people who were stopping their country having a good place in the new world order. Everybody believed at that stage that Germany would win. And it's only, you know, there's a phrase of the resistance of the 11e heure, the 11th hour. And it was very late on that people started to change. So when you're writing history, you have to remember that, that they don't know. Should they run away? Should they grab their belongings and leave? Should they compromise mm. with the evil forces? Absolutely. Or just keep their heads down and put their families first and just say, OK, I don't really care that much. I'm, of course, I'm going to convert to whatever I've got to convert to. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, you know, that's it. And, you, and it's also the idea that everybody believed. Um, you know, you can't... When you're writing about faith in the 15th and 16th century, it was as fundamental to everybody's life as breathing. Mm. Not like now when people talk about, well, do you believe in this or do you believe yes, in that? Yes, do you have a it, spiritual yeah, side? Yeah, or, mm. you know, belief, just a, it just didn't exist as a conversation. Mm. So it's hard to, yeah, obviously, you know, we have our background of science which tells us, you know, how things are and how things have come about, but obviously they didn't have that. And then it's, um, well, they did, but well. in the same way that people will look back on now and think that we're all idiots, that we didn't realise this X, Y and Z or that COVID only happened because of this. Mm. I mean every generation feels that they have the most up-to-date information. Mm. It's a huge amount happening in the 17th century. But at the same time, you know, it's very interesting, a lot of the book is set on a ship, and the new book is set on the ship, yeah, the new book I'm writing at the moment is set on a ship, and it's the person that has been giving me advice on that, who is a, a, a retired vice admiral and, you know, his whole career in the Navy, he said, you know, the thing is, Kate, that it's a very odd thing that ships themselves didn't change very much in their build and their design and how they worked from, the, you know, 1300 to 1800. It's only when metal comes in that there is a very, you know, and that was really interesting because everything else was science and certainly with the kind of equipment that they're using, things were changing very quickly in the way that we'll look back over our time and see the huge changes. But I mean, all of these things in a way, but are kind of these are more general points. It comes back when you're writing. But they're writerly questions, aren't they? Yes. Mm. We were just about to ask about what future projects you're both working on. So we'd love to hear more about your book, Kate, and what you're doing next. I believe you're performing. Ah, yes, <laughs> I am. I'm, yes, I'm performing. And... Uh, Warrior Queens has been a, a, just a joyous book to write and to promote and it's been very encouraging and, and great that the audiences have been, there's been a lot of men in the audiences, a lot of men asking questions and the spirit of the book is celebration of, of the women who should be in history but it's also about we all benefit, men and women, if we know the truth of things, that we know that everybody was there. That it, you know, and that's really important to me and that's been fantastic so yes I'm going on the road with a one woman show inspired by the book and it will be a show music and lights and you know no dancing or singing mm. I'm glad to say and that will start in March and I'll be on the road for about six weeks so it will be an enormous challenge and a very different thing to do I'll be away from home for a long time is that your first friends. time performing? I do a great deal of speaking but mm. yes in terms of actually doing a show not since we probably since we met when we were 16. Probably the last show I did. 
you've done a lot more mm. shows because you do theatre. Certainly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm not an actor and I'm not a mm. performer, but I mean, I do a, a, a lot of big speaking, as it were. Yeah. So it won't be so different, but but it will be very exciting. It'll be really good mm. fun to do. <laughs> good luck. Thank you. <laughs> And Greg's same question to you, really. Are you, is there going to be more about Alex or what's, what are you working on next? So Moonflower Books have done a wonderful job with The Coming Darkness. And I'm already contracted to write The Coming Storm, which is the sequel. And I think... And so many of your reviews, darling, have said, we really hope there's a sequel. Haven't they? Which well, we is must brilliant. not let them down. We must not let them down, which is <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Greg's had some amazing reviews, and there's so many books published. So to get any attention at all is, but every single one has been saying more, please. So that is very handy. <laughs> and I think you'll see straight away how how that can be because if you you if you. The climax of the novel, obviously, it, it all comes to a point in this unifying climax of great drama. But that doesn't mean that it's all over. It doesn't mean that every potential enemy has been wiped from the board. So there is necessarily a follow on. And there's also, and I think this again is um, perhaps quite a modern preoccupation, but I think it's important too. There is the impact of the drama of the coming darkness on my central characters' lives, their mm. emotions, their psychology mm. going forward, which is also worth exploring, I think. Yeah, and I was they... wondering, that. we find out more about Alex, do we have a that's lot right. more? That's right, and also those people close to him. Great, that'll be, that's something to look forward to, that's fantastic. Thank you, Tom. Mm. <laughs> and are you working on that now? I am, yes. Yeah. In fact, he's finished it. <laughs> he's very quick, <laughs> very quick. Enviably quick. So, uh, do you have any advice for writers listening to us, just generally about how to, what sort of, perhaps if they're creating a world in the past or the future, what advice would you give to writers? The advice is probably the same, really, which is, there is, there's no shortcut. You know, the only way to write your novel is to sit down and write your novel. And I think that is quite important because people often lose heart. They start and they don't get very far. And... I think you actually just know that your first draft is just for your eyes only and just get it down until you've got something to work with. You don't really know what kind of book you're writing and you don't know what you're capable of. You know, it's like, you know, the analogy I was using, it's like, you know, trying to decorate your house before you put the walls and the, and the roof. On. You know, so everything changes once you've got that sort of sense. So I think the important piece of advice is just do it. Just don't talk about it. Just do it. And know that everybody's first draft is not for public consumption. <laughs> and it's the, for me, it's the thing I mentioned earlier, which is when you write, you should be writing just the moment of drama that you're currently preoccupied with. And then you write another one, then you write another one. And these are the bricks or the blocks from which you build your house and your house is the novel. And then to chime with what Kate said, the moment you've told the whole story and you write the end, it will become plastic and malleable and you'll be able to turn it into the novel that you thought it could be. Mm. But you won't do that straight away. Brilliant. Mm. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, thank you very, very much, you very both much. of you. It's pleasure. been a pleasure. <laughs> that was Greg Moss and Kate Moss in conversation with Martin Nathan and Tabitha Potts. Now we're going to listen to Greg Moss reading from his debut novel, The Coming Darkness. It began very early, one Sunday, a hot summer night in 2037, a little before one o'clock. Marseille was under curfew, a brownout only a few minutes away, inside Bunker Martha the dark shift were on duty. Alexandre Lamarck, a tall man with dark hair and kind eyes, carried a descendant of the Heckler and Koch forty-five caliber pistol he'd been issued on his first day of training twelve years before, plus a sonic immobiliser, 
retrieved from the armory at the local gendarmerie earlier that day. Guaranteed non-lethal, the quartermaster told him, if that's what you're looking for. He stood in deep shadow in an alleyway about 50 metres from the rear of the converted U-boat base, a vast structure still known by its World War II code name. Today, it was an international data centre, housing a vast array of servers, computers, switches and routers. The sky was almost clear, the moon and stars visible beyond the wisps of high cirrus clouds. Between Alex and Bunker Martha, a two-metre fence surrounded a pumping station. Back in the early 2000s, a pragmatic computer engineer whose grandfather had worked the mines above Marseille invented the idea of channelling groundwater from the drainage tunnels in the hills, absorbing the waste heat, and then releasing it out into the blue waters of the Mediterranean. An excellent plan, thought Alex, but also an obvious weakness. That was Greg Moss reading from his new novel, The Coming Darkness, available from Moonflower Publishing. I hope you've enjoyed our interview and reading today. Please do subscribe for more short stories and interviews. Thank you. Goodbye.